John, 1 John chapter 4, nearing the end of the chapter here. This evening we are paying particular attention to verse 18 and up until chapter 5, verse 3. I'm going to read for us 1 John 4 from verse 7, all throughout chapter 5 and verse 5. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent us His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him, and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in, in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but per perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes? that Jesus is the Son of God. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word. The title of our sermon this evening is Assurance of Faith. Assurance of Faith. The assurance that comes from love. The assurance of our faith is the assurance that comes from love. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. I wonder if John... The elder is saying this in regards to these false teachers who have come to terrorize the people of God, telling them they need this secret knowledge, this new knowledge. Some of them become fearful because if I don't know the secret knowledge, what judgment awaits me? What, what awaits me if I don't perfectly keep the law of God? What awaits me if I don't perfectly keep in step with this new knowledge? And we see the proclamation of God's word for the church is not to the terror and the fear of punishment for those who truly believe in Christ. You see, the moment the true believer in Christ, a true Christian, becomes terrorized with terrors of what awaits you are wandering into place where it's dangerous for the Christian, and we know that the, the false teachers are terrorizing the Christians with this, and John is concerned that the church, that the people of God not be terrorized in their faith, but be assured in their faith. Not be terrorized and be fearful of the punishment and the judgment to come, but to be assured as they grow in the knowledge and the grace of Christ Jesus. You see, John knows the power of the gospel. And you see the snowball effect when the gospel is taken away 
our assurance of faith was down. We start doubting our faith. We start doubting the promises of God. And when we start doubting the promises of God, we have no confidence that when we stand before Him in the day of judgment, that our sins are truly forgiven. That's not how the apostles, how they preached to the church. This is not the gospel message. This is not the goal of the gospel. To cause doubts in the Christian. But the gospel of Christ is to still and quiet all of those doubts of those who truly believe and have come to the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Who is it that's come to the knowledge of Christ Jesus? It is those who know that they are poor in spirit. It is those who know that they bring nothing to the table. Only their sin and their brokenness. And they hear the message of the gospel. The gospel message. John 3, 16. Jesus declaring, God so loved the world that he sent his only son into the world. So that those who believe in him may not perish but have eternal life. So that those who believe may have the assurance of eternal life. What does it mean to have the assurance of eternal life? What does this mean to have the assurance of your faith? The assurance means that you trust and you have a calm and a peace about what God has promised you. God has promised those who believe in Christ Jesus eternal life. And so what John is hinting at in verse 18 is that the false teachers in their ministry or supposed ministry has robbed the Christians in the church of their assurance of faith, of their confidence to stand before God with a clear conscience. And John just reminds them, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And the fear that's spoken of is here is not the fear that we should have for God, spoken of in Proverbs 1 and verse 7. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. But the fear here is a fear, a terror of punishment to come. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears is not then perfected in love. You see, the Christian is not terrified to face God on judgment day. Why not? Why is the Christian not terrified about the judgment to come? Because the Christian knows God. The Christian knows God. He knows the judge. We know the judge. What do we know about the judge? We know that he is our father. How do we know that he is our father? Well, John told us in 1 John chapter 2, we have an advocate with the father. We have a legal representative with the Father, who's the judge. And so we have confidence, we don't have fear for punishment, but we have been perfected in love because we have the love of the Father and the love of the Son, which assures us that you will not be punished for your sins. Yes, false teachers, yes, enemies of Christ, I deserve punishment. I'm guilty. I've sinned. I've sinned. But the confidence that I have that I will not be thrown in hell is because there's a man who died on the cross and he died for my sins. How do I know he died for my sins in particular? How is it that you may have the assurance that he died for your sins in particular? And not just for everyone's sin in general. Well, have you confessed your sin to the Father? Have you confessed your sin to Jesus Christ and asked Him forgiveness for our sins? Openly, honestly, and sincerely, God, I acknowledge, I acknowledge my murderous heart. I acknowledge my hatred for you. I acknowledge my hatred for people. I acknowledge my impatience, my idolatry, my adultery. I acknowledge all of that. 
my wicked heart produces sin and it leads to death. And it terrifies me, Lord, that when I face your judgment day, that I'll be crossed in hell. Help me. Help me. Then we hear the invitation of Jesus, come to me, all who are burdened and heavy laden. Why is it that you're burdened and heavy laden? Because you're trying to deal with that guilt of your sin. You're trying somehow to sweep it under the rug. You're trying somehow to excuse yourself. You cannot excuse your sin into non-existence. We can only lie to our conscience to a certain extent and then it comes back at us to haunt us. You've not dealt with this sin openly and honestly. And what do sinners try and do in their sin? And what did they try and do their whole life? Excuse their sin. That's not that bad. I'm not as bad as other people. What do sinners do? They point to people who are worse than they. Look, look. You're concerned by my sin? Just look how terrible that one is. Pushing someone else to the fall. We refuse to face up to our own sin. And in our refusal to face up to our own sin, we're refusing to face up to God. And to refuse to face up to God, we change God and we somehow shape Him in our image and we try and accuse Him of things that's untrue. To discredit God. He's unfair. He's a bully. He's a tyrant. He's a... All of these accusations that people level against God only prove one thing. What is that? It proves that these people think that God is just like them. Isn't it so? That people think that God is just like them and God has to operate according to their standards. How is it that you can judge God to be a tyrant? And because if a person were to behave that way, if a man were to behave in the way that God, it would make him a tyrant. But God is not a tyrant because he's the creator. He's the infinite God. He's not in the same category as us. He's so far above us. And he's good and he's perfect and he's holy and he's just. Who are you, O oh man, to judge God? Who are you to condemn God? Who are you to slander His character? What does it do to God when you slander His character? It just proves, it just proves your own sinfulness, your own lostness. It doesn't do anything to God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God is unchangeable in His being. Unchangeable in His perfection. And why do people do this? Because they think they can manipulate God. You see, they've grown confident because how easy is it to manipulate people? If you really love me, you would do this. If you really are concerned for this, you would do that and that. And then what do we do? We try and prove to these people, well, I am loving. If you say, if I really need to be loving, then I need to do this and this, I'll do it so that I can prove to you I'm loving. And they're sitting there wringing their hands and saying, ha, ah, we've got them right where we want them. That's what the false teachers were doing in the time of John. If you really are Christians, you would believe this and this and this. If you really are Christians, you would do this and this and this and this. And then the Christians go around trying to do these things. And then what happens is they try to do these things to prove that they are really Christians, according to what the false teachers have said. They start to fear, doubt, because their conscience is not clear toward God. 
Because instead of pleasing God, they now want to please their false teachers. To prove to them. You don't have to prove to any man that you are truly a Christian. You don't have to submit yourself or subject yourself to any man's test to see if you are really a Christian or not. Isn't that free? You don't have to be thought a Christian by any man to enter into heaven. Because the criteria for what a Christian is, is a criteria that God tells us. That John is so eager to preserve in his old age that the standard not be shifted. The standard is always love. Love is the standard by which you are measured. Just, we read it, verse 13. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. We testify to the love that God has loved the world with. God so loved the world that He gave His Son. We, we see the love of God for the world. We see it here. In. He's given a gift to the world. If I were to give a gift to my wife, something like a new car with a fancy ribbon, I would give it to her. I know she's looking at me because she doesn't want a fancy car. And give it to her in the sight of all. And people say, oh, he really loves his wife. Look at the gift he's given to her. The same goes for Christ and his church. People should look at the church and say, look at how God blesses his church, his people. By the gift that he gives them. What's the gift that God gives us? The greatest gift of all. Himself. Himself. You know, take that same picture. If I were to give my wife a car, and you would look to her face, and you would see it sort of a stain in her face toward me. You might at some point be tempted to think, well, she doesn't love her husband. And then you might say, but what caused her to have that frown upon her face? And then you see, well, I haven't actually been treating her that well. And I'm trying to manipulate her. And then that changes the whole picture. And so you see, what the world is trying to do is paint a picture to say, God is the one in fault. Well, God is not the one at fault. God never is at fault because He's perfect. The problem is with us. The problem is with us because God gives us these gifts. He gives us of His presence. And what do we want? Instead of His presence, we want the shiny car. We want the blessings of the kingdom without having God. We're like the youngest son in that parable who tells the father, give me my inheritance. Give me my inheritance. I'm a Christian. Give me all of the things you promised me, God. And let me take them and do it whatever I want to do. Let me take them and go. We don't appreciate the presence of God with us. We don't appreciate who God is. But you see, as Christians, those who have the Spirit, He has given us of His Spirit, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. You see, we are joyful because there is the gift. God giving of Himself in His Son, Jesus Christ. God condescending to us. Taking on flesh. Coming to make his dwelling place with us. Truly he is Emmanuel, God with us. That's what God does. Are you thankful that God is living in our midst? Are you thankful for the Holy Spirit which he gives to us? Is that enough for you? Are you content with God and God alone? You say, well, it's nice to have God in our midst. That's nice. 
But really, how practical is that to have God in our midst? I need food, I need shelter, I need this, I need that, I need a shiny, I need a new watch. What else do you need? What else do you need except for God? You see, verse 16, so we have come to know and to believe that the love that God has for us. We come to believe that He has love for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as He is, so also are we in this world. You see, the Father loves us so that we may have confidence in Him. And confidence in Him for the day of trouble, for the day of judgment. My children don't need to worry about where the food will come from for this evening. They pray confidently. What are we eating this evening? And then we give them the heart because we take responsibility to provide for them. Hasn't God taken responsibility to feed you? How do you know that God has taken responsibility to feed you? How do you know you won't go hungry as His child? You're praying to Him, aren't you? Aren't you? Father, give us this day our daily bread. And if He gives you that daily bread, what do you say? Where's the bucket? Is that what you say? Are you going to eat your daily bread or moan that there's no butter? We have to go through this with our kids even. Here, here's your food. Eat. It's good for you. Eat your vegetables. Eat the things which you don't even like to eat because it's good for you. And we as Christians also need to learn eat what's good for you. Eat what's good for you. Eat all of God's Word. Don't ignore the passages. Don't ignore the scriptures which speak of things that are uncomfortable for you. Don't skip over things that you say, ah, oh, no, that's too difficult. Well, that's not appropriate. Again, who are we to judge God's preparation of His meal for His children? You see, we sometimes are like the older son in that parable. When we have the presence of the Father with us always, remember when the Father went out to the oldest son who wouldn't come and feast with the younger brother, with the slaughtered calf, and he stands outside angry because there's a party on and it's a party for my brother. <clears throat> God cannot love him that much. The Father is not right in loving him so much. He should love him more. And he's withheld all of his goodness from me. He's not given me any of the blessings. And the father comes out because the, the calf is just as much as the older brother is. Younger, come and eat some of the calf. Come and enjoy some of the blessings. The blessing of being in my house, being a son of mine. Enjoy the blessing of being a son who's never left my presence. Because isn't that what the Father reminds him of? Why? Why such a long face? Haven't you been with me all this time? Your brother was in the pigsty. He was going through a terrible time while you were in my house. And having the blessing and the sustenance. sinners who think they can just quickly repent and be blessed. <clears throat> We're much like the older brother sometimes, aren't we? And what's the grace in that? The grace there is that God, the father in that story, the father in that parable, loves the younger son and he loves the older son. What is the father's great desire? I just want my sons. I'm happy that the one who was lost was found and came. 
I'm happy for the one who stayed with me and never went away. I just wish he would be more happy to be in my presence. Does God need to sometimes come and shake you a bit and say, hey, have more joy. Have more joy. Life is not all doom and gloom for you. We shouldn't be Christians who come Sunday after Sunday and the more we come on a Sunday service, the less our joy becomes. The world is just so terrible. So we should be shaken up and stirred up to more joy. Isn't it wonderful? Even on a quiet Sunday evening, isn't it wonderful to hear of God's love for you? And we see this confidence and this joy leads us then also forward so that we may have this confidence for the day of judgment. So that we may be prepared for the coming. The coming of the bridegroom according to some of the parables. The coming of the Son of Man. The coming of the Master to His home. You see, why is it that some are troubled and do not have confidence in the day of judgment precisely because they have forsaken the commandments of the master of the house. Following after the false teachers. And here's John's appeal to them. Don't let these false servants manipulate their, you with their words to throw you off of your steady obedience to the Lord. And don't let them lure you away with a shiny new thing. But stay constant in your obedience and your love for the Lord. So that you may have confidence for the day of judgment. You see, whoever fears punishment has not been perfected in love. Whoever fears that day of judgment is not comforted by the love of God. And so where does the assurance of your faith and the assurance of your love come from? You need to produce it in yourself. You don't need to produce the assurance. The assurance comes from the promise of God. But you lack that assurance because you don't lay hold of the assurance by faith. A faith that constantly lays hold of it by patient obedience. It's when we start to doubt the promises of God, or when we're encouraged to act frantically and run after certain things to just get these promises, have more blessing, that we rush into things so that our fingers are burned, our hope and our joy is stolen away. One thing we must note here in verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. You see, there's a process here. If you find yourself in a position where you fear the day of judgment, you fear the punishment to come, perfect love casts out fear. What will cause your fears to be stilled for the day of punishment? To hear of the love of God. To hear it. To know it. Not just to hear it once, but to hear it again and again and again. Just like I have to remind my wife every now and then, I love you. She's heard it many times. But every time I tell her, I love you, her eyes light up. Why? Why? Because she needs that sustaining confidence and assurance. I love you. I love you. Yes, it doesn't matter that something happened today that made you doubt if I will still love you. I love you. Why do I love you as my wife? Because I promise to love you. Isn't that what Christ tells his bride, his church? Why, do, why does he love us? Because you don't anger him at all? Because you behave perfectly, you're, the, you're a good wife, church. Is that why he loves you? Why does he love you? Because of his good character. 
because of who he is, because of what he has promised you. And he assures you. And he can assure you precisely because he remains constant, even when we are not. <clears throat> that is why perfect love casts out fear, because the perfect love is the love with which God loves us, not the love with which we love him. You see, because if it's based on the love with which we love him, our assurance is lost. Why is our assurance lost if it's based on how much we love him? Because the way we love him is today, I love a lot. Love. It's not constant. Our love for God is not constant. What will cause our love for Christ and for God to be more constant? We should desire to be more constant in our love. What causes us to be more constant in our love? Nothing. Nothing can help you to be more constant in your love for Christ than Christ's love itself. Because you can only react to the love and the infinite love with which he loved you first. And so more and more exposure, more and more hearing Christ loves you, God loves you, the more you're able to respond with, I love you too, I love you too. You see? It works this way in marriage. If the husband were to stop telling his wife, I love you, the wife will stop returning the words, I love you too. And what happens? The love in our marriage has died out. Who's responsible? Who's responsible for the love in marriages that die out? Husbands who don't tell their wives, I love you. Is Christ the kind of husband that he doesn't tell his bride, I love you? Or is the bride sometimes deaf? Is the bride oftentimes absent? Or in the bridegroom says, I love you, I love you. Hasn't the Lord Jesus Christ made an appointment with his bride Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and said, I'll declare my love to you openly for everyone to hear so that you may know that I love you and so that everyone may know that I love you. You want to know why there's little reformation, why there's little revival? Where's the bride of Christ when Christ says, oh, I make an appointment to tell you that I love you, to show you that I love you? Why would we absent ourselves? Why would we absent ourselves from this? John, in 1 John 2 and verse 5 says, Whoever keeps his word. How will you keep his word if you don't hear his word? How will you keep his word if you don't hear his word? Whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. So you need to hear the word. The word needs to work in you. You need to obey the word. And so lay hold of the promises. God acts upon you by declaring his love for the bride, and the bride responds in obedience. Laying hold of the promise, being assured. Being assured because it's God's work in us. Whoever keeps his word in him truly, the love of God is perfected, because it's the love of God in Christ Jesus that moves our heart to obedience. And by this we may know that we are in Him whenever we keep His word. 1 John 4 and verse 17 we just read, By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. You see, keeping His word, keeping His word, obeying His word, does not grant us heaven but gives us the assurance that He will give us heaven. Don't rob yourself of the assurance. 
Don't rob yourself of the assurance and don't let anyone rob you of that assurance. By this is love perfected in us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Are you giving up your confidence in the day of judgment by following after other things? Or are you making sure and fighting? Make sure, make sure you're calling an election for Making your calling an election sure. How do you do that? By obedience. Be assured of the promises of God. You see, the power by which you go to heaven is not a power in you, it's a power in God. But you need to be assured that that power of God is at work in your life. And how are you assured of that? It's when by the Spirit of God you hear and are moved to obedience. It's how you know you're alive. You have a pulse. You have a reflex. Big people don't have reflexes. So, in whoever keeps the word, the love of God is perfected. And the purpose for that is so that we may have confidence and assurance. And we see this in verse 19. We see the cause of this assurance is God's love for us. We love because He first loved us. The love that we find in ourselves, the love with which we love God, and the love with which we love our neighbor, is a love that is produced in us by the love with which God loved us with. Where do we see that love? We just said where we saw it. We saw it in the Father sending the Son as the Savior of the world. We see the Father sending the Son to die on the cross for sinners. Why would He do that? Why would He die for us? Why would Jesus suffer the cross for us? Nothing in us. Nothing in my hand I bring. Nothing I have done. All I've done is to estrange God from me every single time. God has not turned his back on you. You have turned your back on God. You see? And you do it again and again and again and again and again and again. What is the grace of the grace of God is to pursue you again, 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 and again, and again. And God pursues you with his grace just one more time longer than you abandon him. And that's all it takes. Isn't that wonderful? That's all it takes. It just takes God one more step toward you to keep it all going. And the question for us is at what point, at what point are you going to turn? And face God. At what point are you going to turn and face God? You see, for us who already turned and faced God, found grace and favor, blessing in facing God. And so we're not running away from Him anymore. But we come to Him. We come to Him that we may see His face, that His face may shine upon us, that His love may continue to work for us, but also through us. And so that we may grow in this assurance. We love because He first loved us. 1 John 3 and verse 16 says, By this we know love, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. You see, we have the pattern, we have the picture of the love of God for us. And then we have the ethical we ought to lay down our lives. That you must, as a Christian, you must do this and you must do this. All of the must, you must do this. It should not be you must do this so that you will be in heaven. You must do this for your salvation. All of it is you must because He has. You must because He has. He has loved you. You must love. He has been patient with you. You must be patient. 
He has been gracious to you, you must be gracious. If he has been kind to you, you must be kind. You see? So if you're not kind, if you're not patient, all those qualities of love in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. If you're not patient, you're not kind, you do not know the God of love. Because knowing the God of love produces in you the fruit of love. You cannot claim to know God if the love of God is not found in you. Matthew 18 and verse 33, we find in the parable, the master saying to the servant, Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? You see again, the pattern there, even in the parable, is set. The Lord and Master sets the pattern for His servants. Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, sets the pattern for us. We ought to, because He has. We have no right to behave differently than our Master. We have no right or freedom to behave differently than our Lord. This was something that struck the young people on Friday when I told them, did Adam have the freedom to eat of the tree in the garden? Or, in one sense, he had the freedom to eat because he ate. God didn't stop him. But in another sense, he had no freedom to eat of the tree because God had told him not to eat of the tree. He had no right, no freedom to do that. Just because you can touch a hot stove flame doesn't mean you should just because you can sin and you have the freedom to sin, the freedom to go drinking, the freedom, you know, you have the ability to do these things, does not mean you have the freedom to do them. Why don't you have the freedom to do them? Because your loving Father has told you no. That's good enough reason, isn't it? That's a good enough reason for us not to sin. My Father will be displeased if I do. You see how wonderful it is in terms of peer pressure for a young child to say something like, my father will be displeased. I'm not going with him. I'll get in a lot of trouble with my father. Because on the authority of my father, I'm not giving in to your peer pressure. What can his peers say? Because how will they win in a fight with the father? They can't prove to this young child that we love you more than your father. The world, the devil, your own flesh doesn't love you more than your father in heaven. Don't give in to their pressures. Tell all of the enemies that tempt you, my father will be displeased. We look at verse 20. 1 John 4 and verse 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. How can you claim to love God in a practical way if you not love people? Because God loves people. God loves sinners. How will you show that the love of God is working in you if you don't love the sinners? If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, you say you love God, yet you hate and despise the church of God. You despise your family, you hate your husband, you hate your wife, you hate your children. You say you love God and you hate people. You're a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Do you love your family members? Do you love your brothers? Do you love your sisters? Do you love your father? Do you love your mother? Do you love your children? That there is a test. Do you love the people closest to you? And do you love them to the extent where even if they don't return your love that you continue to love them, even if they're undeserving of your love. Because you don't love them because they deserve to be loved, remember? Because God doesn't love you because you deserve to be loved. Love. 
God loves you because of his character. And God expects the Christian because he's given you a new nature, a new character. And you must love based on that new nature and the new character with which God created in you. First Timothy 5 and verse 8 says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. If you cannot show practically that you love by providing for the needs of the people and trying to make it more comfortable and more livable for them, he's worse than an unbeliever. You see, what, what, what is needed? Don't be someone just expecting all the time that the people in the house will serve you. Husband, don't be the couch potato coming in the home, sitting in front of the TV, just flipping the channels. And, Where's my coffee? Keep quiet, kids. But come in the home and serve. Make the home a better place for those who live with you. Those are practical ways in which you show love for your family members. Showing love to someone. And God makes it very clear and the apostles and Christians are taught to love those closest to them. That's the commandment. Love your neighbor. You don't have to walk over your neighbor to go help the person next to your neighbor and pretend like that's Christian love. It's not. It's not Christian love if you don't love the one closest to you. You cannot skip over loving this one and then loving someone else. We don't have that kind of a freedom. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. The question then is, where is my neighbor that I may love him? Where is he? You just open your eyes and you see, there's a need. There's a need. I can help. I can help. What can I do? And you just stop. James chapter 2 and verse 14 says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but he does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith that does not have works is dead. If you don't find practical ways in which to show that love, because God has in the most practical way shown His love for you, sending His Son to die on the cross. God is, did not just sit in heaven and declare to you, He loves you, He loves you, without doing anything. Jesus Christ became incarnate. He had a ministry. He died on the cross. He rose from the grave. All that he did for you, to what extent can you love others? You see, to what extent has Christ loved you? What did it cost him to love you? His life. Can you give your life for your husband, for your wife, for your children, for your church, for your community? What right do you have to hold your life for yourself and only live for yourself? What right do you have? As a Christian, do you have a right to live only for yourself, your own pleasures, your own desires? We have no right. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You see, 1 John 4 and verse 21 says, And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. You cannot have one and not the other one. You say you love God, you must love your neighbor. Jesus equated the two. The second is like it. 
The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. John 15, verse 12, Jesus says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Love one another. Lay down your life for one another. Why? Because Christ has done this for you. 1 John 5 and verse 1 tells us, Everyone who believes that Jesus the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father, loves whoever has been born of Him. How is it that you were born from Him? By faith. By faith. You were born by faith. You will love those who have been born by faith. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of God. Do you have the right to doubt the sincere faith of a brother or sister in Christ? Do you have the right to doubt their faith? Do you have the right to be skeptical about their profession of faith? Do you have the right to doubt it? You don't. You don't. We have the obligation to encourage, to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't somehow look at someone's history and say, I doubt whether or not that repentance is even before God. Scold it away as a real sea that we can redeem it. Why would we do something like that? It's because of our own pride and arrogance. We think God loves us because we're so wonderful and we behave so well. We think like the oldest son thinks, God cannot possibly love him because look at what he's done with all the kids. And then when God causes joy over the one son who was lost and was returned, and there's great joy over the one who returned, where are we? You sit with your arms folded and say, I'm not going to be happy with them. I'm not going to be happy that God loves them. Because God should only love them. You see, that's oftentimes the case. What causes our unhappiness? We think that God only loves me. How wonderful it is to hear of God's love. How wonderful it is to hear God's love is fair. It's fair and good because He's holy and righteous and just. May we learn how to be more joyful. May we also learn how to be assured of this love. 1 John 5 and verse 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Jesus invites us to take His commandments upon us. We heard it this morning, Matthew 11 verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me. The gentle yoke of the love of Christ. Learn how to love. What do we do? Loving others is burdensome. It's a lie. It's not burdensome. It will give us rest. Because Christ is gentle and lowly and you will find rest for your soul because His yoke is easy and His burden to love is light. How much does it cost you, in other words, to love others? Not much if I have a God who loves me infinitely. You see, I can always go back and find more love that Christ has for me, which I can then go and love others with. I can never run out, never run out of love if I know where love comes from. May the Lord help us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you.
thank you for the assurance that we cannot run out of love. We know where to find it. And we have truly found the source, a never-ending fountain of love. Thank you for Christ Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The constancy of his love grounds us, gives us assurance, so that we may stand on solid ground, loving others, loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. May we continually return to him, so as not to cut ourselves off from the means of grace but to grow in the knowledge and the love of Christ. Father, we also pray that as we encounter false teachers, as there are temptations to pull away from the love with which you have loved us, as the world offers us many other things, and as the world tells us that they love us, and as the world lies to us and says, God doesn't love you, Father, For us who have put that to the test, we know that no one loves us more than our Father in heaven. No one loves us more than Jesus Christ our Lord. No one loves us more than the Holy Spirit who dwells with us. And so, Father, help us, we pray, that we may love our neighbor. We pray that you forgive us our sin and that you cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That to you belong the power and the glory now and forevermore. Amen.